you who um, have not um, uh, joined our seminars before. Um, we have presentations that are uh, 20 to, to 35 uh, minutes in length, with a bit of uh, flexibility there. And we kindly ask that you keep your microphones uh, muted uh, during the presentation so as not to disturb the presenter. And if you're struggling with uh, connection, please um, uh, turn your video off because that can help to improve the connection. Uh, after the seminar, we'll have a chance for a 10 to 15 minute um, question and discussion session. If you don't want to ask your question uh, online, um, please type it into the chat and um, I can read it out to the to the presenter. And as always, we've got life going on uh, around us. Um, so if you have to go, please uh, get up and go. It's not a problem at all. Uh, and at the end of the seminars, we have a chance uh, for a bit of a catch up if anybody's interested, uh, a bit of a social aspect to the seminars. Uh, and this is, is, is not recorded, so it's, it's uh, a relaxed environment. Uh, and so today, uh, I'm really pleased that we've got uh, Gemma Richardson from uh, the BGS here in the UK, and she's going to be talking to us today about uh, space weather. So I will hand over uh, to you, Gemma. Okay, thanks, Greg. Okay, so hi everyone, as, as Greg said, I'm here from the British Geological Survey. Um, I've not put everybody's name on the talk because there's lots of people in the Geomagnetism team who I'm sure I'm stealing some of their work, but I will give them full credit in due course, I'm sure. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to talk about space weather and its impact on grounded technology. Um, so I thought I'd start by give, doing a quick kind of introduction to space weather. I'm, I'm aware that for a lot of you, space weather impacts on geomagnetic data are probably just your noise and you don't care too much. So I thought I'd do a quick overview of kind of what space weather is and why it kind of matters to me. And then I'll talk a little bit about the research that I've been doing uh, into power grids and pipelines, and then talk a little bit about some projects that we're involved in um, for operational services. So space weather, it's essentially just a term um, to describe the variability of conditions in near Earth space environment. Um, specifically here we're using it to refer to conditions that have an impact on technology, infrastructure and people either in space or on or near the ground. Um, so this is the kind of classic image from ESA that I'm sure you've all come across before, which is showing all the different impacts of space weather on different kind of types of technology. So the things that are obvious like satellites and astronauts because they're up in space, they're affected by space weather. Um, either directly by radiation or degradation, sometimes with things like single event upsets, which can kind of affect what a satellite's doing and maybe confuse the operators down on the ground because they maybe lose the satellite for a little bit. Um, as we move further down into the ionosphere, there's then space weather can cause lots of enhanced currents and other disturbances within the ionosphere that then make it very difficult for satellite signals to pass through. So that can lead to, to um, you know, errors in satellite communications. It can lead to uh, a reduction of accuracy of things like GPS, which isn't going to affect you in your car with your satellite navigation system because it's not that accurate anyway. But there are lots of systems around the world that rely on very precise GPS. So if your GPS signal is getting delayed in the ionosphere, that's going to have a, an impact and reduce your accuracy, which, which can be really important. Um, if we move a bit further down, again, down to the, to the ground, that's the bit where, that I'm gonna talk about today. So space weather can cause these kind of uh, induced geoelectric fields, which then can lead to geomagnetically induced currents in things like power lines. And of course it can reduce accuracy of directional drilling. So if you're not aware of um, a lot of drilling activities because they're underground, GPS doesn't really work and having to use um, other precision ways of navigating your well path on the ground are quite expensive. So they actually use the magnetic field. But obviously, if there's a big geomagnetic storm going on, that's going to affect their measurements and therefore where they think their drill path is going. So it's important that they understand um, whether there's a storm going to happen or not. So in terms of ground effects, there's kind of two main causes of space weather impacts at the Earth. So the first is coronal holes. 
Um, and these are regions on the sun's surface that appear darker under lots of different filters um, because they're a little bit colder and have a slightly lower density plasma than the average uh, in the corona. And they're linked to open magnetic field lines. So basically that just means it's easier for things to escape into the solar wind. So in the solar wind, you get from these corona holes, you get these fast patches. And because everything's rotating, these fast patches hit the slower patches from before and you can get compression regions. So when that sweep past the earth, you get a kind of a shock, um, or you can get a shock depending on how fast they are. And you can get lots of disturbances in the magnetic field. Now, coronal holes don't tend to cause massive geomagnetic storms, but they can be significant. The other main one is coronal mass ejections. So coronal mass ejections are usually associated with solar flares or occasionally filament eruptions, although both of these can be happen independently of coronal mass ejections as well. Um, so solar flares are just these really bright um, releases of energy, which they're classified in terms of the X-ray flux that they release at the time. And then filaments. So the filament here is just this dark string um, above the surface of the sun. And if I just play this video, you can see it uh, erupting quite spectacularly. So they can lead to, to what we call a coronal mass ejection. So what is a coronal mass ejection? Well, um, here's one going off here, which I think you can, if I just pause it, you can see. So there's a nice um, big bubble of stuff, basically leaving the solar surface. So the sun is approximately where the white circle is and the satellite has a, what's called an occulting disk. So effectively we're looking at an eclipse from space but it's a man-made eclipse because we've just blocked out the sun. So this is the sun's corona, and you can see there's a big bubble. This is the corona mass ejection heading off the side of the sun in this case. Um, and that's full of lots of charged particles and lots of solar magnetic field that's all jumbled up. Um, in this case, if it was heading off towards the side, it's not such a problem, but here's one that was heading towards the earth, which, went so fast you can barely see it. So I'll just slow that down so you can see, this is what we'd call a full halo coronal mass ejection. It's called a full halo just because it goes all the way around the sun. And this one was definitely heading towards us because you could see all the scintillation on the, the camera. So this is one of those kind of space weather effects of all those charged particles hitting the camera afterwards. And you can see that over time, that's gonna, that's gonna do some damage. But as I say, the bit I'm interested in is the actual coronal mass ejection. So that can take anywhere between around kind of 14 hours to five days to get to us, depending on the speed of that, that coronal mass ejection. And when they get to the Earth, they cause geomagnetic storms. So again, as I'm sure you're all very aware, this is a kind of nice quiet day um, curve from, a, from one of our geomagnetic observatories. This is Estelmir. And here's the same observatory, but on a stormy day and these, you know, the storm itself, the variations are much larger than they were on a quiet day. I mean, they're still small compared to the background field, but it's this, the rapid variations that are really, really the issue. And that's because it causes electric fields to be induced in the ground, which then causes currents to flow in ground-based infrastructure. So power networks, pipelines, railways, uh, et cetera. So in 2012, this was recognised by the UK government as being a, a genuine risk to the UK. Um, so space weather is circled here as number 19 on the risk register in the latest edition, saying that there is a relatively high likelihood of a space weather, uh, a big space weather event uh, affecting the UK with what they call level C level impact. So a kind of relatively high level in impact. So just for reference, 25 here is at the impact of a global pandemic. Um, so space weather is kind of considered a similar likelihood to that, but hopefully not quite as impactful. Certainly not for as long, we would hope. Um, so in terms of mitigating space weather, then the first thing we can do is to forecast it. Uh, so there's lots and lots of different um, ways of looking at the sun now. So there's quite a few satellites 
or continuously monitoring the sun, either looking directly kind of at the sun itself through different filters to, so that we can see when there's sunspots or you know these images from Soho that I just showed you looking for coronal mass ejections and disturbances in the corona. And there's also uh, the new Discover satellite, which is an operational satellite measuring the solar wind at the L1 point at all times. And then there are other things like the GOES uh, sat satellites, which measure the X-ray flux. So they give you that um, size of flares that, that we've seen. Now, there has been an increasing amount of solar monitoring happening over the last few years, which is fantastic. But for the most part, they're all based either at the L1 point, so between the sun and the earth, or actually orbiting the earth. So we kind of have quite a one dimensional view of the sun. So this, this plot here is just kind of, imagine we're looking down on the, the solar system effectively. So pretty much our only viewpoint is from just in front of the earth or at the earth. Now there is the stereo satellites, which so marked here as A and B. So they have over time gradually drifted around Earth's orbit. So a head started ahead of the Earth. That's why it's that's what the A stands for. And it's gone all the way around now, past the back of the sun, and it's now behind the Earth, effectively. And the behind one started the other way and it went all the way other around. Unfortunately, we've lost contact with stereo behind uh, since it went behind the sun. So we're no longer getting data from it. But right now, Stereo A is giving us a brilliant view of the sun because by looking at this kind of different angle, you can get much better estimate of the speed of say CMEs when they're coming towards the earth. And it also measures the solar wind um, before it gets to the earth. So because the sun is obviously rotating, if something on the sun here is rotating around, it's gonna sweep past ahead before it gets to earth. So that's great, but that's a science mission. And as I say, the whole point of that science mission was that it's continuously moving around Earth's orbit. So it's not always in that position. There are plans to launch a new satellite. So ESA has plans to launch a satellite to the L5 point, which is near where Stereo Ahead is at the moment. Um, so that will be brilliant when it goes up. But in terms of kind of actual data, we're maybe a little bit lacking in, in what we need for really, really good forecasts of space weather. And just incidentally, that ESA mission um, is currently looking for a name. So if anybody has any ideas of good names for ESA missions, you can go on and submit it on the ESA website at the moment, I think. Um, as well as uh, satellite data, there's also a growing suite of other data and models and forecasts, um, which again is brilliant that we're, we're getting so much better and they're all improving, but we're still a long way from really being able to forecast space weather in a kind of prompt and meaningful way. So for example, this model here is called the Enlil model. And that's great, you can see, so these blobs here were, were two different uh, CMEs that launched and it gives you an estimate of arrival time and the velocity of the solar wind when it gets to earth and all that kind of stuff. But the problem with models like this at the moment is Firstly, they need the data to go in. So you need to have got the da enough data back from say the satellites to be able to analyze your coronal mass ejection, which takes time. And then once you've analyzed it, you need somebody to have put it into the model and set the model running. And then the model itself takes around six hours to run. So that takes, you know, that's quite a big chunk of time. You know, by the time you're gonna get results, it's probably gonna be around 10 hours or so since the launch of the CME. And the fastest known CME to ever reach us was around 14 hours. So that's not gonna give you a huge amount of, of warning time um, if we need to do something drastic in terms of a huge CME coming our way. Um, but it's improving all the time. And I say the models themselves are improving all the time. And there's lots of very clever people working on trying to forecast flares and CMEs before they even happen, which is kind of the ultimate really in terms of being able to, to respond to one of these threats. Uh, and this, this on the right hand side, this is the European Space Agency's new space weather service portal, which anyone can register to, to look at. And it has lots and lots of new uh, products, um, including things like forecasts of DBDT, but they're, um, 
yeah, they're still very much a kind of work in progress and they're quite large, broad scale. Um, so at BGS, we do do a, a three day ahead forecast every day. Um, and that goes to our stakeholders. So people like National Grid who run the power network and people who do directional drilling for the oil industry, but it also goes up on our website so you can you know, access it publicly at this, this link. And we tweet it as well. And then if there is, if we do expect a big storm to come, we also have an alert service. So you sub can subscribe to that at our website or we have a separate um, Twitter account as well because not everybody wants to hear the, uh, everyone wants to see the space weather forecast every day when it mostly just says quiet. Although some people apparently find that very soothing. Um, but we have the uh, Aurora alert separately for people who just want to know when there's something interesting going on. And then other things we do, we run a kind of operational um, nowcast system for geomagnetically induced currents in the grid for national grid. Um, and we also give them other information like what's happening in the magnetic field and the solar wind at any time. And then we also run other pages like this. So this is for the Met Office. So the Met Office have the most up-to-date um, information because they, if it, um, in terms of the government, they own the space weather risk for the UK. So they need to be well informed about what's happening both on the ground and up in space. And then this is our contribution to the, the ESA portal. So there's lots and lots of kind of forecasting and operational work going on and they're improving all the time and there's new models and new forecasts being added all the time. Okay, so in terms of our research on um, GICs, um, again, for anyone who, who doesn't know what happens during geomagnetic storm, you get this electrical current in the ionosphere, which then induces a varying magnetic field perpendicular, which then induces an electric field in the ground. And electric fields like to find nice, easy routes to flow. So they find power grids, which are by design um, as low resistance as possible for electricity to flow along because that's, that's their purpose. Um, so GSEs tend to find these points and they flow into the, the earthing points at transformers and then through the grid. And for the most part, they, they act like quasi DC currents, but the power grid is set up to cope with AC currents. So what can happen is that can lead to things like voltage instabilities, uh, which can cause uh, problems within the grid itself. And, and the main thing that can do is actually to trip protective relays, because generally in you know, every other day, a voltage instability would suggest that there's some other problem. So it will shut down or might switch off something or to shut down a transformer. Um, the problem with space weather is if you have GSEs in the network, they're kind of through the whole network. And if you start unplugging bits of that network, you then concentrate the GSEs into specific bits of the network, which can then really cause problems. Um, in the absolute worst case scenario, GSEs push transformers out of their normal operating capacity. And that means they heat up. And in the very worst case, that causes some quite significant damage. So this is a transformer coil, which should be all you know, nice and smooth and metallic. And you can see here, it's, it's basically got so hot that it's um, sparked and burnt parts of the transformer. So this transformer had to be completely replaced due to a space or event. And transformers are not easy things to replace. They are very large, and very expensive. And there aren't that many of them surplus at any one time. So again, another issue of space weather is that it, it has quite global impacts. So in a really big event, there is a, a slight worry that if enough power grids lost transformers, it would take a very long time to replace them because they just they don't sit around on shelves waiting to be to be used. Although the awareness around it has improved a lot. So I think some people there are, there's more resilience being built into systems. So there's more transformers at each substation if they're a key, very important substation anyway. So how do we actually model it? Well, it takes, there's kind of three stages. So we start with some inputs, then we create some models, 
and then we create some some proper outputs the actual GIC. So we start with data from observatories so here's a whole range of observatories that are kind of vaguely in the region of the UK so some of these are marked on this map as the white triangle some of them are slightly out of shot here and what we do is we take off the quiet time mean because we're not too worried about the main field um, uh, what we want to capture is these these rapid variations um, and then we so we can take all of this data and then we use what's called the spherical elementary current systems uh, to interpolate the magnetic field across the UK so we can get a picture of what the magnetic field is doing um, right across the UK in both um, in the horizontal components so x and x and y. Uh, we then also need a conductivity model so at the moment we use um, a model based on the geological map of the UK so what we've effectively said is we expect each rock unit to have approximately a certain conductivity and that is um, built into a model um, which is meant to represent approximately the top three kilometers um, of the surface and then underneath that we have a series of 1D models um, so they only vary with depth uh, based again very loosely on kind of bedrock geology of the UK um, and we call that our kind of thin sheet model so we can use our thin sheet model where you so you effectively use the 1D models to get the electric field due to the magnetic cha changes and then the thin sheet on top redistributes that current uh, to give you where the, the highest electric fields on the surface would be, which means we can include the kind of coastal effects. So you can see that sometimes the electric field current kind of builds up a little bit along the coast, um, as you might expect. So as a slight aside from that, one thing we are doing at the moment is to try and improve our electric field model. So the thin sheet model is great in terms of its it gives you some of the detail um, whilst still being relatively computationally efficient. So a 3D model would be great, but they're very computationally expensive to run. And at the moment, we just don't have that level of data for the UK. Um, so there's three main ways to derive ground electric fields. So first is measurement. So we do now have long-term measurements of the electric field at our three UK observatories. And that's great to have because it gives us something we can validate our models with. And to do that, we just take some non-polarizing non uh, electrodes and we put them in a kind of solution to again, help reduce polarization even more. And you put them at, you know, put two nodes um, apart in the east-west direction and two in the north-south direction. So this is the setup at Heartland and you can measure the electric fields and that's, um, uh, been really good but there are some problems so the data quality isn't always brilliant because we're definitely learning as we go um, and it's been improving as we go but there are gaps and, and problems that we know we need to address and the other thing is of course you're not necessarily just measuring the space weather uh, so here's a plot from Heartland on the right so this is a stack plot for June 2013 so each line is a different day just plotted against time uh, and you can really clearly see the tidal effect in there because there's a huge tidal range very close to the observatory so that's again just something a little complication that we need to think about when we're comparing our, our model to our measurements. Uh, the other way as we've already slightly discussed is uh, you can drive ground electric field through modeling so as I said, at the moment we use the thin sheet model um, and we are trying to work on improving that and then the last one is these imp uh, empty impedance transfer functions um, in combination with magnetic field observations and we're starting to do a little bit more of that so here's an example from um, Whitehaven in Scotland where we've now got some good MT measurements but one of the issues we've had for the UK is there's a the measurements we have are relatively sparse but there's a few programs from a couple of different projects um, over the last few years and going into the future where we've been trying to firstly find legacy data but also take new measurements so we can really improve that and that's I think probably the way we're headed is to try and 
really use MT impedance transfer functions a lot more than we do. And just as a little example, here's an um, example from a paper we've just released showing some comparisons between the measurements. So the blue lines here for Lerwick, Estemia, and then Heartland at the bottom oh, are measurements of the electric field. The green is the MT impedance and the red is the thin sheet. And you can see in most cases, we're kind of, we're capturing the essence of the storm, but we're maybe slightly underestimating the peaks and missing a little bit of the detail at, at times. The MT, funk, the MT impedances do a lot better uh, than the thin sheet. We're, we're definitely underestimating with the thin sheet. So it's a, an active area where we're, we're trying to improve. Okay, so the next thing we need once we've got our electric field is our power network model. Uh, so we construct a power network model using the 10 year statement that's published every year by National Grid. Um, and that has information about the resistance of the lines and the resistance of the transformers. Uh, we still have to make assumptions about the, the earthing resistance, uh, but it does give us a huge amount of information. We're now able to model that to a much better level than we have in the past. And at the moment, power lines are then just approximated by straight lines between the grids, because that's the information in that statement. However, I am just now working on actually being able to include the full path um, between each substation, which will make a slight, at least a slight difference to our results because it changes the length of the line to start off with. And it also changes which bits of the electric field are kind of inducing currents in that particular line. And then once we've got all of that, we can plug it into our GIC model and, and get GIC out at the end. So here's an example for the March 1989 storm. You can see some fairly significant GIC at certain substations around the UK. And you notice that it's you know, mostly red on one side and mostly blue on the other side. And that's just because the, the kind of inducing electric field is mostly east-west in this case. So the currents flow into the grid on one side and out of the grid on the other side. Um, okay, the other thing we've been working on much more recently is um, the effect that that has on pipelines. So unlike power grids, which as I say, can kind of catastrophically fail during a storm very quickly, the effect on pipelines is a bit more gradual. It's more about the corrosion rate. So by, pipelines are protected, steel pipelines particularly, are protected from corrosion using what's called gal galvanic protection. And it's just about maintaining the potential of the pipe um, at a level approximately one volt below that of the ground um, so that you protect the pipe from corrosion and it stops the, um, it stops you getting currents flowing from one to the other. Um, but during a space weather event or even, it doesn't even have to be that big a storm you can quite quickly override that protection. So potentially you're then increasing the corrosion rate compared to what you know, the pipeline is planned to deal with. Uh, so that can shorten the life of pipes. And in some cases, particularly if there's already been a little bit of damage, it could then um, really exacerbate the situation and make your pipeline fail much more quickly than you expect it to. And there is, there is a case in New Zealand which you may remember was in the news a few years ago that the main uh, fuel pipeline to Auckland Airport um, suddenly failed one day and it caused a huge headache for the airport for quite some time. Um, and there is a suggestion that um, although the pipeline had already been damaged, there was a scratch across it from uh, previous uh, construction work. I think a digger had at some point managed to scratch the pipe. But the failure only happened a few days after a really big storm, um, geomagnetic storm. So there is, there has been some suggestion that perhaps the, the storm contributed to increasing the corrosion and was kind of the final, final straw. Uh, so here's our new model for the UK. So uh, on the left here is just a model I've taken again from open source data on National Grid Gas's website, uh, giving a, a full pipeline network for the high pressure gas transmission system uh, with kind of where we think the different lines end and where they connect to other nodes. 
Um, and then here on the right is the practice oil potentials that we've modeled uh, for the grid for fitness was during a storm again. And you can see we get some really quite significant, you know, well, well over 40 volt um, pipe soil potentials in certain places, which is much, much larger than the, the one volt range um, that the galvanic protection is trying to keep the pipeline at. So it's definitely something that we need to do more work on and to understand better as there's lots and lots of assumptions in this pipe, but it's it's definitely worth doing and understanding, especially as the, the um, gas pipelines in the UK start to get that bit older. We need to know that they're not going to suddenly fail. Um, okay, so moving on to another little project. So we've recently been involved in the SWIGS project, which is a, a big um, four year project called um, Space Weather Impact on Ground Based Systems, a big NERC funded project. Um, and as part of that, we've started making our own GIC measurements because we do have some GIC measurements from the from Scottish Power, but they're at these only at these four sites in the grid. So it's not overly representative of the grid. And we do have to remember to ask for the data. Otherwise, it gets deleted after a couple of weeks. It's you know far from a continuous uh, set of data that we can just uh, pull into. And we don't necessarily fully understand uh, what that data is, whether it's for a single transformer or whether it's the, <coughs> the GSE at, through the, the earthing point or, or what. So what we've started doing now is making our own measurements that we control and we understand. And we do this with the differential magnetometer method, um, where you basically put one magnetometer under the power line, one at a distance away, um, and you align them so you know they're both aligned the same way. And you assume that any difference between the two is due to the GSE and the line because they should be close enough that they're experiencing the same um, external magnetic field, but far enough apart that only one of them is being affected by the line. Um, and you can read about that in the, the paper that um, Juliana recently had published. And that has been really useful. We started to look at um, that compared to our model. So Whitehaven here is this, this cross here, and these are the, the line GIC for that um, under that line. So we can do the, the measured data using that, that DMM system compared to the modeled. And it shows that actually we're not, we're not too far off. There's still definitely work to do on our model, and particularly the input electric field. But actually it's a surprisingly good good result really and then we can also compare that um, with data at the at the GIC site as well so Dorness is one of the sites that we've got GIC for um, okay so just as a kind of final point the um we're also involved in a couple of big projects where we're bringing together all that research and our own expertise of um, doing operational space weather into um, a much more kind of large scale organized system. So this swimmer set of activities is set up, it's a joint initiative by NERC and STFC, but it's also supported by um, a few government uh, bodies and the Met Office, where the aim is to basically improve the UK's capability at, at forecasting and now casting space weather. Um, so for the first time, we're going to be using so models like uh, Gorgon, which can um, is a big, complicated MHR, uh, MHR model to give solar winds, uh, sorry, to give magnetospheric uh, impacts, to then give us the ground magnetic field, which then we can uh, forecast GICs and we've not been able to forecast GICs like that in the in the UK and that's um, something that we're, that we're working hard on now and hopefully once we can link that all up that will be a really um, really fantastically useful system for the UK and the other project is called Euphoria so again it's a very kind of similar idea where you've got this kind of sun to earth chain of space weather and this is a big European model 
Um, so you have these MHD models of the corona and then the solar wind and the magnetosphere, which then leads us to a GIC prediction. Um, so, you know, here's our kind of first work on that, where we've got a conductivity model for Europe, admittedly much less sophisticated than what I was just talking about for the UK. But that can then give us electric field hazard maps. And then I've also constructed a GIC map, uh, uh, GIC power grid model for the whole of Europe. So we can then get GIC out at the end of this project, hopefully. Um, and yeah, that's the summary. And I realize I've talked for slightly longer than I meant to. So I'll just leave that there and see if anybody has any questions. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much, Gemma. We can all um, give Gemma a virtual round of applause uh, through Zoom for actually a really, really interesting talk. Um, so I'll open uh, the floor to questions. Um, so you can raise your hand um, uh, via the Zoom uh, functions there for questions for Gemma. But we'll kick off with one um, in the chat from, from Gunther, um, who is asking, um, are there, or, or unless or Gunther, do you want to read out your, your question? Yeah, yeah. You're, you're there. <laughs> Hi, first, uh, thank you very much for interesting talk. I'm glad that uh, finally there is also talk from the space physics because it's kind of was, was missing in here in this community. And uh, my question is more like a little basic one, I'm sure probably, but uh, since you didn't talk too much about it, uh, I, hang on, it's, uh, it's about the, uh, you know, the, there is a solar cycle and usually every 11 years, there's a change of the polarity. And I, I wonder, you know, what will be the next topology for the cycle 25? Is there any um, attempts to predict, uh, you know, how the cycle will be intense? And uh, I think at least for Mars, it's very different if, the, uh, if, the, if there is like a north the south topology for the events that are happening on, a, on the ground of Mars. And I think it's uh, probably the ca same case also for the Earth, that it has to do with the way how the, how the magnetic field reconnect. But if you could clarify that, please. Um, yeah, so in terms of the solar cycle, we've, we've just entered the latest solar cycles so at 25. Um, the consensus opinion, so there's a group that all get together each solar cycle to predict the next solar cycle. So their, their consensus is that we will see a solar cycle that is similar to cycle 24, so the one that's just happened. There is one new paper and the name of the, oh, the name of which completely escapes me, but I'm sure I can find it, who have used a new method of forecasting and they're actually predicting a much larger, more active cycle. Um, but that's a brand new technique and they're not, um, I guess we'll have to wait and see whether they're, they're right or not. But the kind of consensus opinion is it will be similar to the previous one. Uh, in terms of the, the polarity of the, so which part of the cycle we're in, that doesn't matter too much. So the, the polarity of the sunspots on the sun I don't think it has a huge impact on um, how effective space weather is. What does matter is the angle of the um, solar magnetic field at the point that it reaches the Earth. So any coronal mass ejection can contain that kind of interplanetary magnetic field. But if it's strongly southwards, then that connects very well to the Earth's magnetic field and you get a much bigger storm as a result. But it's not necessarily dependent on the solar cycle, or which, whether we're in a solar cycle where it's predominantly northwards or predominantly southwards. Hopefully that answers what you. Thank you, I appreciate it. I have more questions, but I'll wait until someone else asks some questions. Yeah, so I'm assuming Richard Holm will have a question since he's uh, <laughs> unmuted and uh, video is on. On you go, Richard. Hey Gemma, um, I was really impressed by your modelling of the events and your, you had your thin sheet and your MT um, uh, models. Could you possibly zip back to that briefly? Mm -hmm. so, there he is. Was any? Mm -hmm. Was that him? Yeah. But, but so back, so forward one again, so see the data. Yeah. 
Oh, the days. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, so looking at those, yeah, uh, as you're quite right, the thin sheet is smaller magnitude, mm -hmm. but it is, you know, it's pretty good. Um, so, could you try a just kind of um, data modeling fit where you just scaled, and maybe had a, a scaling as a function of um, intensity or scaling as a function of period of the variations and therefore avoid having to be too clever because my brain isn't good enough for MT um, as the MT people who talk to me will know um, and just just, just do a, a heuristic fit. Yeah it's definitely definitely an option. Um, we've kind of only just really started to get into properly with the, the data that we've measured and unfortunately as I say the, the data are a little bit um, gappy and of poor quality at times this is one of the good examples but yeah we could definitely go through and find you know patches that are good and see if we can come up with some kind of scaling yeah that's, that's so, yeah I, I see student project you may remember being forced to do student project from strange things. <laughs> <laughs> thank you Gemma thanks Richard, thanks, Richard. um well, I'm going to quickly squeeze in with a question of my own before we, we jump over to anybody else but you know when you're doing your the maps of the the power grid um you know you're, you're doing it in a very crude fashion but then you're saying you're you're going down to the detail and mapping out the, the details of the network i mean how are you actually doing that are there the detailed records available that you can use um yes so on again open source from national grid's website we can get shape files for england and wales which actually do detail the the path of the lines um, and I have almost managed to get those into our network uh, and there's also other sources so for Scotland we can get so open street map there's lots of very dedicated people have mapped the paths of power lines near them um, so we're looking at whether we can include those but the first a little thing, bit of crowdsourced data then going into it yeah, yeah it's pretty cool yeah it's great uh, so, so Gunther, did you have another question you said? Yes, I have a, a quick question. I know that a lot of the space weather events are connected with the process, which is not very well known for this polar magnetic community. It's called the reconnection. And I know that, the, you know, a lot of, you know, there is some kind of, almost looks like there's some kind of a magic around it, how it's actually happening, because suddenly you have a stationary ions near the sun, and suddenly there is an acceleration of that ion to the outward speed, which is, I mean, uh, probably uh, tens of kilometers per second. And if you could clarify it, or almost to tell how it, this process is important for this space weather. Um, yeah, simplify. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I have to admit, I'm not as good on reconnection as I'd like to be, because as you say, it does tend to get presented as, as magic a little bit, and I'm, I'm happy to go with that. But um, basically, I think a lot of it's around um, kind of magnetic tension, effectively. So the, when the solar wind, if it's pointing southwards, it connects really well to the, basically the front of the magnetic field. And it essentially kind of opens it up, um, pulls it to the back. And then at some point, you know, there's a huge amount of energy and that field line wants to reconnect. And that's where you throw huge amounts of energy into the system. Um, beyond that, I'm not sure I can really give you a much better description. <laughs> it's okay. Let me give you another question, which is, uh... A little bit related, but not exactly. It uh, there's a moon that kind of goes around, and I always wonder if, for example, if the moon is between the Earth and the Sun, uh, I'm sure there is, must be a plasma sphere uh, because of the moon is uh, like an obstacle to the solar wind, and does that plasma sphere affects in any way the space weather? Hmm, that is a good question. Not that I'm aware of, but that, yeah, I guess it might do um, to some extent, but yeah, it's not something I've ever really seen any research on, so I can't give you a, 
a clear answer on that. <laughs> and then my next question, thank you, is uh, the ULF, uh, the ultra low frequency waves that are generated. In, uh, uh, I always was kind of wondering what's the power spectrum? Uh, I, I, what's the, where are the frequencies that are, you know, I, I know that there is a, the lower, longer the frequency of electromagnetic waves, the more penetration to the ground. Uh, but the, if there is any way that you could uh, say something about the spectrum, how the spectrum look like of these waves that are coming in because of the solar uh, the space weather. Um, so, trying to think now, definitely got the brain on. Um, yeah, the, so the kind of space weather effects that we tend to worry about are kind of somewhere between, uh, we're talking about kind of, you know, point, or like a few seconds up to a few hours, generally. Um, the stuff that, in terms of effects in the GIC, we're only really interested in the kind of Kind of around one hertz kind of plus or minus a little bit um but yeah again i'm not sure i can give you a much better answer than that right now well uh let me uh, thank, thank you very much Gunther. We've, we've got it we've got uh time okay. for one last quick question from from uh gautier and then i'm conscious of time we'll need to, to sort of wrap it up so uh gautier uh, would you like to to, to answer ask your question yeah, I'll ask it, not answer it. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the presentation. Sorry, I was a bit late, so maybe some of the information I missed. Um, I, I had actually two two quick questions. One uh, is a bit related to the previous one, and and I was just wondering which is the frequency which is most efficient in terms of producing uh, problems. In other words, when you have a geomagnetic event, I mean, it's it's it has a wide spectrum. Uh, which are the frequency we need to worry most about? And perhaps the answer is different for electric grids and, and pipelines. I don't know. And the second one was uh, one of your slides where you're showing the uh, results of the electric field produced on the pipelines. Uh, the structure was most, uh, uh, much less uh, intuitive to me than the one you showed for the electric grids. So we have these red dots that come around. And I just wanted to ask you, uh, what was the reason for this? Is this because of changes in the resistivity of the pipeline structure, or, or is this related to the geomagnetic field itself? Uh, a little bit of both. So it's partly the resistivity of the, the pipeline itself. It's partly the length of a pipeline that are fully connected. So the longer the pipeline is, that is connected, then the, the larger the currents. Um, that you get, and therefore the larger the, the uh, potentials that you can also get. And yeah, I think in this case, it was also partly related to the electric field in the background as well. So I think I think this was from a storm where there was a strong electric field, or well, the strongest electric field is kind of across here in the UK. Um, and the longest pipeline in the network kind of comes right down here. So we tend to find the largest PSPs around that basically. Okay. Um, in terms of the the kind of periods that matter, the jury's still out a little bit. Um, certainly for pipelines, it's something that I want to look at is whether some of the kind of, I'd have, I, I suspect the really high frequency things don't really matter to the pipelines because they're kind of on and off so quickly that it's not gonna affect um, corrosion. In terms of GIC, again, we tend to talk about kind of tens of seconds up to a few minutes, maybe up to 10 minutes, that kind of range being the important range. But again, there's still a little bit of debate around whether, you know, you can, the really high frequency stuff is just so quick that actually it doesn't have time to produce a response in the system. And actually whether it's some of the slightly longer period fluctuations that, that matter, but yeah, kind of, Around that kind of, as I say, 10 seconds to a few minutes of the kind of the bit we tend to be more concerned about um, for, for power grids. Thanks a lot.
Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so in the interest of time, I think we can uh, uh, wrap up our uh, question and discussion session. So thank you very much, Gemma. We can all give her another uh, virtual round of applause for uh, a really interesting, uh, a really interesting talk. Um, so just before um, we completely uh, come to a close today, um, just a, a, a reminder um, that um, our next two seminars will be in two weeks and then in another two weeks and our speakers are still to uh, still to be confirmed. Um, but we're always looking for uh, more speakers um, covering all topics uh, across uh, earth science magnetisms uh, and, and, and in particular we encourage uh, early career uh, scientists. So if you're interested in giving a presentation or you know somebody who might be um, uh, able to give a really good presentation, please uh, get in touch with us. Uh, and also just a final reminder that um, all of the seminars uh, are recorded and they're available uh, on our YouTube channel. So if you miss out on any of the seminars in the past, you can catch up with them all uh, on YouTube. And thank you all very much again for, for joining this week's Magnets and we'll see you, see you next time. Cheers. <laughs>